This episode of the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast is sponsored by Waterworks Lamps and Fly Reels. Looking to upgrade your fly reel? Upgrade to a Waterworks Lamps and Fly Reel today. Try the all new Waterworks Lamps and Lightspeed F and feel the difference. For more information on Waterworks Lamps and visit waterworkslampson.com. Now let's get back to the show. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Keenan. This is Season 3 of the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. In this episode, we aim to bring you the biggest and best stories from those who work and make our fly fishing industry truly great. The Fly Fishing Insider Podcast dives deep into the past, present, and future of all our guests, uncovering their amazing stories and journey. Join us each week as we interview a new podcast guest. Also, if you're new to the show or not yet a subscriber, make sure you hit subscribe after this episode. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Today, our guest, Bradley Bonnet. Bradley is a, uh, a longtime Alaskan guide and lodge manager, and he's here today to tell us more about that life and uh, offer some advice on how people can get into uh, becoming a guide up in Alaska. So through uh, through Bradley's advice, hopefully that can we can make that happen for a few people. Bradley, how's it going, man? It's going good, man. How are you doing, Greg? Oh, busy, good. Life is good, so, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, you got a good story to tell, and I always like to jump into it, but, you know, I'm going to keep it the the same method and model here. So tell me how you got into fly fishing. So I got into fly fishing, kind of a a random, you know, occurrence that my grandpa got a VHS tape about how to fly fish small streams, and he was not a fly fisherman. So he kind of gave it to me and I loved to watch it and always wanted to do that. And so when I was about 11, got a fly rod for my birthday and kind of went from there and, and anything that was fly fishing, I just absorbed. Was that like a garage sale and find the, or something that tape? I, I, <laughs> I, I think he got it for, I don't know if it was a father's day gift or a birthday or something. It was really random that he, that he got it, but they knew he liked fishing. He was kind of the, you know, person that would always take me and go fishing. And so, you know, that was just something that we had in common. And he knew that I'd love that tape and I'd watch it when I'd go to his house. And so he ended up just giving it to me and it actually kind of, what was it, you know, what ignited the spark in me, I guess. Crazy. So after the tape, uh, fast forward a few years, take us to that, to that point in your life. So I kind of, you know, I just really had this passion to really find out how and what, you know, and it was a little bit before, you know, you could find stuff so easy on the internet. And so I would, you know, buy every fly fishing magazine that I saw, any books, anything that I could, you know, take in, I would read and kind of absorb that and try to, you know, go out and, you know, model after that or whatever I'd learned. and it was kind of a (laughs) trial by fire, but it was, I had a good buddy that kind of got into it with me. And so it was some common ground that we had. And, you know, he helped me out a lot. He was a little bit older than me and kind of was a lot better fly tire. His flies definitely worked better than mine did at that point. So, um, yeah, it just kind of really was something that, I wanted to do and I loved to do and it was a really big passion of mine and a lot of people didn't understand it you know way back then and why I wanted to do this what was considered kind of an old man sport at the time crazy and then so basically how did that transpire into you like getting up to Alaska like when and what age I mean you're a young guy now yeah so yeah yeah no it was just uh kind of random that I had a guy that I knew that guided in Alaska. He called me one day, knew that I was, you know, an avid fly fisherman and just said, Hey, I've got this guy in Alaska. He's looking for guides. Do you want to, you know, would you want to be a guide in Alaska? You know, and of course it's kind of uh, a lot of people's dreams is to go up and, and guide in Alaska. So I said, sure the lodge he gave me the guy's number 
told him about me. I called him up and he just said, you know, how long you've been fly fishing. He said for a long time, you know, he asked me, you know, kind of what I'd fished for. And I told him rainbows, browns, you know, kind of a trout, you know, fly fishing guy. So that was my experience. And he said, okay, well, get your guide license and I'll see you in a couple of months. And that was, you know, kind of all I had to go on was, okay, well, you know, what my friend was telling me and, you know, what I kind of thought I knew about being a guide in Alaska, Mm -hmm. which was, you know, come to find out was completely off and wrong and all the stuff that I, you know, thought I needed, (laughs) I didn't. And (laughs) so so, we're going to go through all that because we, I think we need to, but yeah, go carry, carry on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I get, I get up to the law or going through the guide system. I mean, that's a serious, you know, uh, application to actually get your, uh, six pack, you know, Alaska six pack license. It's, you know, you have to do, uh, you have to go up and take a class and a test and you have to have so many boat hours to even, you know, qualify for it. But I, I just got mine done right at the, the last second, picked it up uh, from Anchorage from this class that I had to go to and went basically straight to the airport and went out to the lodge in Bristol Bay. And yeah, when I got there, it was a little different. I thought, you know, guides just basically you take people out fishing and that was all you had to do. And it was kind of a... <laughs> not a rude awakening, but just really different from what I had envisioned being Alaska guide. I mean, you do a lot of different things and you kind of have to have a skill level in all of it. So it's kind of, um, yeah, I mean, you just have to be really well rounded in boat mechanics, being a builder, everything. Yeah, Bradley, let me jump in on that then. So what, what courses did you take pre going up there? And then what, well, what is an Alaska six pack? Like what, what are the courses that you had to, to successfully complete before even becoming a guy? So, yeah. So there's a class that you take in Anchorage. I mean, it's basically for your six pack license. And I, I mean, it's been 15 years ago since I got it, uh, so I, I'm hoping that I remember everything right, but you had to you had to send in your certification. It has to be um, when I did it, it was a background check, and then you had to have three uh, letters of recommendations, and uh, I think it was 180 boat hours, and then um, you have to have a physical go through and make sure that there's nothing wrong with you. Your eyesight has to be, you know, spot on. If you have glasses or contacts, it's not, uh, you know, a big deal. It just says on your license that you need to have contacts and or glasses with you at all times or be wearing them at all times, I guess. So, I mean, it's, it was, it was a lot, you know, for me thinking that I just, you know, got a guide license and that's, that's how it was supposed to be. But, this is actually, yeah, you're, so it's a merchant mariner's credentials is what they call it. And it takes quite a bit of effort to, to get that. And luckily I was able to, to pull it all together in the, the short amount of time that I had. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So, so then take us to the, to the, to the lodge that you went to in Bristol Bay for, this is your first year, let's say. And you mentioned, you know, you brought, yeah. you brought all the wrong stuff. What'd you bring like four weights or, or, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know what you brought, but, no. um, you know, take us to I that, mean, to, to that and what that eye opening was from your first year and then follow it up with like, perhaps like w- what you've learned from that. Yeah. So, I mean, going up there, I, I just, I thought it was, you know, like this really nice. And I mean, it was a nice lodge, but I was thinking like you needed, you know, normal clothes plus guide, you know, wear and all that stuff. And I get up there and it's, you know, I mean, it's rural Bush, Alaska. I mean, you're in your waders probably 90% of the time. And if you're not, then you're, you know, cleaning fish or working on boats. And so I brought a ton of gear. I brought like 
I think four bags full of clothes and, you know, fishing stuff. And it was just, I didn't do a whole lot of research into what type of flies that I needed. Mm-hmm. Like I was using stuff or had stuff in my, in my fly boxes that were like Prova river and, you know, little teeny stuff and just really wasn't, you know, as prepared for the type of fishing I was going to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I figured, you, you know, anyone, you know, like would, assume, would try that or, or assume that at least their first year for sure. Yeah. Huh. And huh. I mean, and, and just when you get to the lodge, that was the big thing is it's a startup. Like the lodge I worked for was kind of a medium sized lodge. It, you know, we didn't have a bunch of uh, like landman is what they call them guys that fill up your boats that basically do kind of all the, you know, the grunt work or whatever. So we were basically getting the lodge ready for clients to be there. I mean, we did, you know, plumbing, construction, you know, patched roof stuff that had, you know, happened over the winter that was there. And I mean, a lot of guys say, you know, yeah, that's normal. You know, you have to kind of expect that that's going to be, you know, what you do. And we always had a, a catchphrase that we had, that we always said that was, uh, you know, guys would come up and they'd say, I didn't sign on for this. And, it was, you know, which is kind of where I was at my first year. I was just like, I didn't, you know, I wanted to guide. Like, this is not guiding. I was doing something similar back home. You know, I was working construction back home. Like, this is not guiding. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of coined a phrase that was, you know, when they'd say that, we'd all kind of look at each other and say, oh, so you want to be a guide in Alaska, you know, because people don't really talk about everything that goes on to get these big lodges ready for the fishing season that have been sitting for, you know, most of them, you know, six to seven months out of the year. Totally agree with that. Right. And it's funny you mentioned like, you know, that that's such a common phrase. And even in my work, um, I didn't sign on for that. So obviously that was a big shock to you and and whatnot, but you, you managed to to continue. Now walk us through what the fishing was like, like in the first year, like for, for 10 years and to run lodges and do stuff like that. There's a reason that brought you back and that's where we're going to go with it. Right. I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's not, you know, building, building roofs and stuff like that. I'm assuming it's got to be the fishing or the clients. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Definitely. Definitely not. The building did not bring me back to Alaska. I mean, the fishing was, it was that good. I mean, Bristol Bay is just so pristine and still so wild that I mean, anything that you go for, it was just like, you know, there's such an abundance of fish and in that first area that I was at in the Wood Tick Chick State Park, I mean, we could go for Northern Pike, Grayling, Rainbows, you know, Arctic Char, you know, and basically in one day. I mean, if you really wanted to. And so that was all great. Those are all resident fish. But the one thing that was really amazing to me was you know, a lot of these rivers, you just don't see fish, you know, you see, I'll always see these videos of red sockeye, you know, just stuffed full in these Mm -hmm. rivers. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the year, you know, they're void of a lot of fish. And so I just remember, uh, the owner at Bear Claw, he would send us down in a boat to check to see if there were salmon coming, if there were sockeyes running up the river. And, I remember just going down, not seeing any fish, not seeing anything, you know, and thinking, you know, what are we doing? Like, this is, this is crazy. Like, like we're going to see fish. And one day we were down there and all of a sudden these bright silver fish, just hordes of them just started coming up the river. And it just reminded me of like uh, Geppetto when he's catching all the tuna inside of the well, man. It was crazy to see all these fish just everywhere. All of a sudden, they just were there. And 
that really resonated in me. And I mean, that was kind of one of the coolest things that I always read books and seen stuff in magazines, but that was one of the craziest things that I'd ever seen. And one of the coolest things to actually see these fish migrate back from the ocean, know where they're going in the, you know, muddy waters of the New Shigak Bay out there coming in and, you know, just heading north and heading where they uh, they were born and everything. So it was pretty crazy. So clearly that moment is what brought you back. So, and then, yeah. You know, and then, yeah, to focus on that, like to, to come back. So, your season winds up, you go home, and then here it is. Right. Your second year, did the did the lodge manager or the owner reach you and say, hey, you coming back? Or, like, what? where, where are you at on that? Yeah. So, I mean, that that was kind of another thing that no one really talked about. Is I, did, I thought once you had a job, you know, you, it was kind of like here. Like, you do your job and, you know, you come back regardless. And then one of the other guys said, oh, yeah, you know, last year the owner basically wiped the slate of all the guides and wanted to start fresh. And I was kind of a last year new guide. So, you know, it's me and you and a couple other guys. And I was thinking, you know, the first time, oh, crap, like I don't have a reserved spot at this lodge. I'm not guaranteed a spot next year. Like I'm going to have to you know, work hard and do whatever it takes to get back there. Huh. And yeah, so that was, it was, it was an eye opener for me that it was like, okay, you've got to work to take that spot. And finally, you know, the end of the season, I thought for a long time, the owner was just didn't really like me. And he more, you know, come to find out was more just testing to see what I would do, you know, without being, kind of coddled you know like he wanted to see if i could take whatever he'd throw at me Mm -hmm. and you came back and so yeah yeah so uh the next season when i came back it was you know like whole different scenario i mean i knew what i needed i knew what i needed to take you know I did not have four bags this time full of stuff. Like I had one decent sized bag that had all my fishing gear in it. I knew flies that I needed to take, you know, stuff that I had ran short on that I knew I needed extra. I mean, it was totally just so much easier. The stress and everything of not really knowing was gone and you know, your waters, you know, where you need to be fishing, what times of year, how you're supposed to be fishing it it just totally changed from being so scared of going out with people in a place that I was not really familiar with to, Oh yeah. You know, I remember all this, this is exactly where we need to be and what we can do at this point in time. So just really from one year to year two was totally different. Exactly. Yep. And that's what that's what I'm trying to point out. It took a while to figure that one out, yeah. but it, you know what? We got it, and that's what we want to point out. So that that lifestyle for you now that transpired into what ten years of you doing that lifestyle. Yeah. So ten. Yeah, I mean that. Oh, it. Yeah, no, I mean that's just like what I did. I mean, that it became you know me. Like I'd go to Alaska every season and it just really grows on you. And, you know, since I haven't been going, it's just really weird because every year at the same time, I'd be gearing up to, to head up there. And it just, yeah, it's hard. It's hard not to, to be able to see those things and, you know, fly in a float plane weekly, you know, a few Mm -hmm. times and just experience all these things that you'd kind of start to take for granted a little bit. And it's just, I mean, Alaska is everything that everyone says it is. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went to Alaska and, you know, it's phenomenal. I love it. I'm go, you know, God, for I hope we can go back mm-hmm. here. I know we have something in the works, but, um, you know, 
but I went as a guest, so it's a different experience, right? Um, oh yeah, than, yeah. Than as a as a guide, and you worked it and breathed it. But you're right; it is there is something up there that's super cool. So I want to I want to shift the the um the podcast to like helping someone, like I mentioned at the beginning in, in the intro. There, we want to help someone. Like, what are some right. ways that you know someone could get involved with if they're thinking about you know guiding up there for a summer? Or, uh, you know, what they just basically want to know, like, what it takes or what, what are some of the, you know, experiences or ways or, or direction that you can point a listener or, or, you know, someone that's thinking about wanting to get up there um, through your years of knowledge yeah. and, and whatnot. And, you know, because I, I like and I know we'll jump into it in a second here, but I, I the reason why I'm asking is, like, you, you talked about the, the authenticity of your story at the beginning, like not knowing um you know you brought that right. out you you're fully open and admitting of that um to like hey you know the second year it got better i got this we figured it out you know um so yeah like yeah walk us through what some some steps or what they should expect and all that sort of stuff and in, in becoming an alaskan guide yeah i mean kind of you know the first thing i would say is just be you know mentally prepared to be in alaska I mean, you're going to be with the same people that are at that lodge for four and a half to five months. And, you know, you're in Bush, Alaska. You can't get away. You can't leave, you know, and go home at the end of the day and be done with it. Like you're there at the lodge for four and a half to five months. And a lot of people have a hard time. You know, I'd probably say that was one of the biggest causes of guys going home early was because they'd be homesick. You know, their girlfriend would be telling them that they're leaving them, whatever. They they just couldn't handle, you know, not being there and being around them. So that's that's probably one of the biggest ones. Like I said, it just, you know, that's the one big thing that people go home for in Alaska is they're just not mentally prepared to be there for that long. Were, so were you in a relationship when you went to Alaska or, or did it? Oh yeah. <laughs> Probably every year except for, I think it was my fourth or third year going up. I met uh, Kelsey who is now my wife and she actually ran the gauntlet of me being gone for two seasons Okay, up there which was amazing. And I kind of, that was kind of the tester. I was like, wow, she can, you know, deal with that with me being gone for two, you know, full summers. Then I, you know, that's the girl right there. She understands, she gets me. She knows that that's a passion of mine, that it's not just something that I'm going to do to play, to have fun. Like yeah. that's what I do for work. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a big thing is, you know, they think that, oh, you're just going up there. You're having fun. You're fishing every day. Oh, you know, I know. You work your butt off. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's... So, yeah, I mean, that that was a big thing is, I, I mean, your girlfriend is basically 90% of the time going to leave you when you are up there. I've seen it happen to so many guys. So. You, you just kind of have to be prepared for that. And unless your girlfriend's been there for a while, it, 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 it could happen to anyone. And I know you say girlfriend. It, it could be, you know. It, it, yeah, whatever. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah, wife, other, husband, like, whatever. Maybe your yeah. cat. Maybe your cat if you left it at home. I mean, it might run away. <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah, no, it definitely anything and everything kind of, it starts to get into your head Yeah, and, and you it, start yeah. because I mean, you've got time on your hands to just sit there and ponder and think about stuff. And it can be, you know, kind of the devil's advocate when you're up there. Yeah. You're there to clear your head, but all of a sudden your, your head gets filled with crap. So then, yeah, wait, like, I guess when you got, are around and you're in a tight quarters like that and you're in, in a, in a lodge setting and you're with the same people, I mean, obviously in, you know, you're on the phone or internet or how, however that worked with your girlfriend. Um, you yeah. know, what are some ways, what are some of the ways that you guys, uh, you know, coped? Like how did you keep busy in the downtime? So, uh, one of the big things was, you know, we, we were working, a lot. I mean, you'd go, you go from 
early in the morning, you finish up with your, you know, with your clients at about after about 10 hours, eight to 10 hours of fishing. And then, you know, at Bear Claw, like I said, it was kind of a medium sized lodge. So if there were salmon, you know, we filleted all the fish, you package it all up, vacuum pack it, you know, and that kind of, kind of kept me, you know, sound as far as that went because I was always busy doing something. And then we had about usually Saturday, the clients would leave and then we wouldn't have anyone back until Sunday. And the owner of the lodge, you know, would always let us kind of go out and go fun fishing and, you know, kind of go out and explore. And I think that that was a big part of helping me as a guide because it helped me learn the water personally. So I knew what it needed, you know, what it took for other people to catch fish or for me to put other people on those fish is because it's hard to do that with clients, but that kind of, it kind of kept me, you know, entertained and out of, you know, thinking about what's going on back home and Mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. So what are some other, what are some other, um, ways that that anyone getting into, uh, or thinking about this need to prepare for? Um, I, I would say, you know, research your area you're going to, because I didn't, and it kind of came back to bite me. I didn't really know what I was in for, what I was expected of me. That's a big one, you know is just look into where you're going, what type of fishing you're going to be doing, you know, what kind of outfit that you're going into, because that's another one that, you know, you kind of need to know who you're working for and what their operation is, because I didn't know that I would be doing some spin fishing too. Like I kind of hadn't spin fished since I was a little kid Mm -hmm. and got up there and they were like, oh, well, yeah, you know, there's going to be clients that don't want to fly fish or don't want to learn how to fly fish. And you're going to have to teach them that. So kind of know what you're in for as far as what the lodge, how their operation runs and what they kind of, uh, expect from you. And that'll help out big with your first year, kind of getting through that first year. Yeah. Anything else? And, um, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, the, the, one of the big things for me was, you know, guys that knew how to tie flies because you're out in Bush, Alaska, you know, everyone can kind of tie certain patterns that are specific for the areas that they normally fish, but you're out there and there's no fly shops around. You know, you've got a stock supply of whatever the lodge has ordered for the season. Chances are you run out and you're going to have to make do with being able to tie flies. You know, that's another thing that's, that's really, (laughs) you know, kind of crucial because you're going out on a guide trip and you're knowing that this one fly is going to do better than anything else you're going to fish. And you have one or two left (laughs) and clients is this anyone that's ever guided knows that that's, you know, those are going to be gone shortly (laughs) before noon. Yeah. Yeah. Literally like you expect those to be done by, you know, lunchtime. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So yeah, that's a big one. Um, and just kind of being, you know, I, 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 feel like I'm kind of being repetitive on just being prepared, but just kind of, you know, uh, how you act is a big thing too, because you being a new guide coming in to a lodge where, you know, a lot of times it's guides that have been there for five, six, you know, even 10 years, they've been working together. And so, you know, the way you conduct yourself around these guys is going to basically determine how you, you know, do as far as how well you're going to do at that lodge. And people have asked me that. And I always tell them that you need to kind of do what they tell you to, but, you know, keep in mind that they could, you know, kind of get you going on other things that, uh, they just want to see if you'll do. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. But I mean, just participate. You know, if they tell you you need to be doing something, just believe that that's, you know, they've been here. They know what that is. Pick their brains, ask for, you know, ask questions. Don't try to be the guy that comes in that thinks he knows everything because those guys have been living there. They know the water. They know everything, you know, yeah. like pick their brains, ask them what's going on, you know, what they need to be doing, why they had, you know, why you had such a hard day, whatever, because those guys know what's going on and w- what they can do to help you out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Having those relationships and forming those relationships with your, with your colleagues is definitely important. Going to make a, make your season good or bad. You know what I mean? Depends on uh, yeah. which yeah. way you go with it. So, Oh yeah. You gave me four tips. Can I you- mean, it's just, you gave us four tips. There's, um, would you say like any, you know, what about what what about anything with the guests? Like, were any anything like that? Is there any tips that you would offer clients with guests? Like, would you? I guess you have to be personable and educational. Um, is there yeah, any, you know? it, 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 that's that's one thing. Is when I was you know became the lodge manager, is I'd always tell the guides you know that they needed to be professional and you need to, you know. You're, you're this superstar in the client side. You live the Alaska lifestyle. You're out there, you're guiding and you're doing this every day. You know, they're going to think that until you prove them otherwise. Like you've got to be, you know, energetic. I know sometimes it's hard, but you kind of have to fill out your clientele. You kind of just need to see what they like, you know, try to build on that, try to make them, you know, like you're there, you're out fishing with one of your buddies. Absolutely. And that, that'll really help with, you know, how your day goes, because if you come out in the morning, you've got a bad, you know, just in a really bad mood, then it kind of resonates in your boat. You know, you're with these two guys for 10 hours. And if you're ornery and don't really want to, you know, get into it and guide and, you know, be excited for these people and for this trip because a lot of the clients, you know, that's a once in a lifetime, you know, trip that they're taking. And I always would tell my guys that that's, you don't want to be the reason why they say, Oh yeah, Alaska was great. But you know, my guide was an on, you know, an honorary freaking bugger the whole time. Yeah. As a client, I mean, we think you guys got the best job in the world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So show them, show us. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree. With exactly. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's just well put. Like I, I really tried to, you know, make sure that that was something that was in the forefront of their mind is, you know, you guys are superstars, you know, show them that that's, this is exactly what they came here to do. Like you're excited for them. Because that's their experience and all this for the first time. Yes, this is your, you know, third month and five years in. You've seen it all before, but these people haven't. And you need to understand that they're just excited as you were the first time you ever saw that. So, Bradley, that's, uh, any, is there any other steps that you would mention uh, or any other pointers that you'd like to, to mention on, on people that want to get into this? I would, yeah, I mean, it just... I would think that, you know, just be prepared for what, what Alaska is going to be like, because it's not just going to be fishing, you know, that's a big part of it. And that's, that's what you are there to do, but you know, you're going to have to, to live with the same people. You're going to have to, you know, build buildings, repair stuff, be able to work on boats. That's another thing, you know, kind of know your basic things about, uh, you know, your tiller handled boat motors or whatever motor that you guys are running, because there's just a couple of key things that can go wrong with those boats and you being able to fix them, you know, quickly and on, you know, out in the field is whether your day goes really bad and you have to sit there and wait for a tow or you can fix it and get back on with uh, where you're going. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just kind of being a little bit well-rounded, understand that, you know, it's not just about, you're not just going to be up there fishing and have a good time, man. I mean, that's, that's a big thing is your attitude and the way you go about going up to Alaska and being a guide is going to really, uh, 
kind of, I don't know, uh, <laughs> just kind of exude from you as far as your clients are going to, you know, pick up on that. Just the energy that you kind of put out there is going to be what they take in and how your guiding experience is going to go up there. But yeah, I just say, make sure you study up on everything and where you're going to be. Yeah, uh, definitely. I agree with that. Plus, you know, you gave us the five tips of being ready, you know, do your research, wearing your fly tying, right. And uh, how you act. So yeah. def- definitely if you, you know, incorporate all those into your, your practice for sure. So l- let me ask this. If someone's listening and they wanted to reach out and ask more questions or, or ask you questions, like where could they reach you to do so? Um, social media is great. Uh, it's fly fish underscore elevated is my Instagram handle. Uh, Bradley Bonnet on Facebook, fly fishing elevated at Gmail. They want to, you know, email something, but I'm really good. I've talked to a lot of guides that have gone up there and that want to learn how and kind of how did it to uh, get started with it because I've got a lot of connections with, uh, you know, the people at like Alaska yeah. waters consulting mm-hmm. to get your guide license or, you know, operations that are up there that, uh, are needing guides, whatever. Yeah. I still have a lot of friends that work up there. So, yeah. And I'm glad you pointed that. I was just going to say that I was just going to mention that, you know, you're heavily connected and well connected up there. Um, you know, for someone that, is listening and wants to like, Hey, there doesn't know where to start. And you know, can you do this? You know, you're not saying you can get them a job, but what you are saying is you can definitely steer someone in the right way. And I want to clarify that. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, dude, so much, so much knowledge today. Um, so much knowledge. (laughs) So what, um, any final words for, uh, for any listeners out there? I don't know. I feel like I've talked too much. <laughs> well, you're telling your story, man. Um, I can't tell it for you. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. It's, yeah. Um, no, I just, I feel like, you know, going into guiding and stuff, it can be a little scary and you don't really know, you know, what the outcome's going to be, but I, it was great. My story turned out really well. I mean, as long as you, you know, follow a lot of the steps that I said, you know, it'll really help you out. And it's from a lot of, you know, trial and error on my part and watching other guides and, you know, hiring and firing other guides. So, yeah. So, yeah, just take take that. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Definitely. I'm going to make sure I put um, all the details in the show notes of where people can reach you at, plus uh, a couple of our key points that you went over as well. So, Definitely. You know, Bradley, I want to thank you, man, and uh, definitely uh, happy that we got this one out. out. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people are going to learn from that as well. So, listeners, I want to thank you guys as well. So, thanks, Brad. Awesome. I appreciate it, Greg. No worries, buddy. You've been listening to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, tell us by liking this episode and subscribing to the show. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. See you next week.